Hello, this is me in February 1989, standing outside Wyndham's Theatre in London, where I was going to see The Secret of Sherlock Holmes, starring Jeremy Brett and Edward Hardwick. The same year, in November, I saw it again at the Alexandra Theatre in Birmingham, in Britain's second city, where I was living at the time as a student. And I've thought of it for years as a bit of a TV cash in. I did enjoy it at the time but I have an image of it in my mind as something rather slender. Now it's come to my attention very recently that there is an audio recording of it online. It's very easy to get hold of. Uh, somebody snuck a tape recorder into one of the performances. It was never filmed. Um, so this is the best we've got. And I've listened to it again. And it's it's time to reassess it I think. So let's look at So before we get to the meat of it, let's just look back to the 1980s when I was in my teens. Uh, Arthur Conan Doyle's work had gone out of copyright in 1980, or the end of 1980. He died in 1930. And uh, in those days, it was 50 years after the author's death instead of 70. And it just seemed that all of a sudden you couldn't move for TV adaptations of Sherlock Holmes. There was a series, a call, it was a kid's series, called uh, Young Sherlock, The Secret of the Manor House, starring Guy Henry as a teenage Sherlock Holmes. That would be followed a few years later, actually, by a Spielberg-produced movie, Young Sherlock Holmes. Uh, but in the midst of all this, the big shining jewel of Sherlock Holmes adaptations was the Granada TV series produced in Manchester by Michael Cox. A prestige series that, for the first time, would try to do the Conan Doyle stories justice and do them faithfully. And to this end, Cox cast uh, Jeremy Brett, a Sherlock Holmes, a guy who'd been, I mean, he'd been a pretty boy actor in his youth, I suppose. Um, and he was a method actor, and he'd played Watson before on stage in Los Angeles with Charlton Heston as Holmes. The important thing is that Brett, who in real life was a very flamboyant, friendly, sunny kind of guy, wanted to be the definitive Sherlock Holmes, which in many people's eyes he is. And so he immersed himself in the character of this lonely, tortured, emotionally repressed genius. At the same time the series was reinventing Dr. Watson in terms of screen adaptations at least because ever since Nigel Bruce in the Basil Rathbone films of the 30s and 40s people have thought of Watson as a bit of an idiot, as a bumbler. And David Burke who played him in the first 13 stories, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, was more faithful to the Conan Doyle canon by making him nobody's fool. He left the series after the 13th episode, The Final Problem, which is the story where Holmes confronts Moriarty and is apparently killed as they plunge into the Reichenbach Falls in Switzerland and was replaced for all subsequent series by Edward Hardwick. So what's this all got to do with The Secret of Sherlock Holmes? Well, in 1987 we were coming up to the centenary of Holmes because the very first story, A Study in Scarlet, was part of Beaton's Christmas Annual, published in 1887. And so Brett commissioned one of the writers of the TV series, Jeremy Paul, who was an old friend of his, to write a play for him. I've seen it suggested that Brett was co-author of the play, uncredited. Um, I don't know about that, but what is certainly true is that in immersing himself in the Holmes stories, uh, he invented all these little stories in his mind about uh, Holmes's youth and his parents and his school days. And he rattled all these stories off onto tape, gave them to Jeremy Paul, and some of it was incorporated into the final product. Your household must have been extraordinarily alive with intellectual pursuits. How much one conceals from a friend. Even a friend as close to me as Watson. 
the play as it was rehearsed originally incorporated Moriarty as a physical presence and he was played by the playwright Jeremy Paul. I was reading in fact that at one of the rehearsals uh, the actor Robert Stevens came along which must have been pretty mind-blowing because Stevens had played Holmes for Billy Wilder in the 1970 film The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes. But what we got in the end was a two-hander with Brett and Hardwick because a producer had come along to one look at this and thought wow we could really make money out of this. There were concerns about the toll this would take on Brett's health because he wasn't a well man. Um, uh, playing Holmes had taken a, a mental toll on him because he took the character home with him and his wife had died in 1985 and a while after that he started displaying these wild mood swings, manic depressive mood swings and was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. So the thought of him doing eight shows a week in the West End uh, caused some people around him to pause, I think. Nevertheless, it all went ahead. This is a flyer from Wyndham's Theatre that I picked up in London at the time. I'm pretty sure I bought a programme, but I can't find it anywhere. It's in two halves of about 40 minutes each, and the first act is kind of a crash course in Sherlock Holmes, as if people didn't know this stuff already. Maybe they, maybe they don't. Maybe, maybe it's only the aficionados who know about uh, how they met at a Bart's Medical School and things like that. So it's a series of vignettes that give you a potted history of Holmes and Watson's relationship. And listening to the audio, the thing that struck me was that Paul does this quite skillfully um, in that he'll take these little moments that illustrate their relationship and in the hands of old pros like Brett and Hardwick, something that might have been faintly amusing when you read it, gets a big laugh from the audience. Watson, congratulate me, I'm engaged to be married. Thank you, very congratulations. To whom? The Melbourne's housemaid. I needed information. <laughs> the first meeting at Bart's where Holmes is beating cadavers to see if they bruise. The fact that Holmes is so wrapped up in his world of criminality and being a detective that he doesn't know the earth goes round the sun. The moment where he examines the pocket watch of Watson's brother and can tell him all about him. But there's hardly any data. It has recently been cleaned. Yes. Yes. Subject to your correction, I would say that it belonged to your elder brother, who inherited it from your father, H.W., who has been dead these many years. <coughs> your brother was left with good prospects, but he threw away his chances, lived for some time in poverty with occasional short intervals of prosperity, until finally taking to drink, he died. <laughs> that is all I can gather. <laughs> that is unworthy of you, Holmes. You have made inquiries into the history of my unhappy brother, the Stamford, wasn't it? And now you pretend to deduce this knowledge in some fanciful way. It is not calm. A little thing like Holmes's musical talents. Just as well for two fellows to get to know the worst of one another before they start living together. I get, I get up at all sorts of extraordinary hours. I'm uh, extremely lazy. Oh, and I, uh, I object to rows. My uh, nerves are shaken. You include the violin in your category of rows? Violin? Well, that depends upon the player. A well-played violin is a treat for the gods. A badly played one. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> so as the first act continues, we get into the final problem. I suppose you have never heard of Professor Moriarty. Never. There is the genius and the wonder of the thing. The man pervades London, and yet no one has heard of him. That is what sets him on a pinnacle. What's he done? He is the Napoleon of crime, Watson. What happened on that fateful trip is well recorded. And it is not a subject upon which I would willingly dwell. 
But should there be anyone here ignorant of that appalling event, let me simply say that near the Swiss village of Maringen, at the falls of Reichenbach, where the torrent, swollen by the melting snow, plunges into a tremendous abyss, Holmes finally confronted his arch enemy, Moriarty. I regarded as the best and wisest man I've ever known. And as I was listening, I did remember the final scene before the interval, which is from the follow-up story, The Empty House, where Holmes comes back disguised as an elderly bookseller and then flings off his disguise and, and Watson faints. I have a little patient here who requires my urgent attention. <laughs> oh, oh, Watson, it is so good to stretch oneself. You know, it's no joke taking a foot at one's height for several hours on end. Oh, it's but... Watson! <laughs> I have a thousand apologies. <laughs> but I had no idea that you'd be so affected. So we get into the second act, and it becomes more of an original work that examines the enduring friendship of Holmes and Watson that is tested to its limit by the fact that Holmes spends three years pretending to be dead and doesn't tell his best friend about it. He lets him grieve. Watson pretty much shrugs this off in Conan Doyle's hands, but Paul's depiction is, I think, much more realistic. If you value our friendship as little as that, whatever your reason, I could have accommodated it. Just a word, a simple note. My pen, his lady's secret, so precious that a man can allow his closest friend to believe him to be dead for three whole years. Consider the reverse. If I had disappeared without a word to you, would you not take it as a trifle unfeeling of me? I have considered it uncharacteristic. <laughs> I have examined the data, drawn my conclusion. Coldly, without emotion, I have offended you deeply. If I was to tell you what's happened, could you find it in your soul to forgive me? And so we get to the so-called secret of Sherlock Holmes, which is quite ambiguously played, so you don't know whether he means it or not. But he puts the suggestion to Watson that perhaps Moriarty wasn't real, that he, Holmes, had made the whole thing up as an intellectual exercise and a way to get to know the criminal underworld better. Ah, it is evident that you don't know me. On the contrary, I think it's fairly evident that I do. It has been a... Uh... An intellectual treat to deal with you, Mr. Holmes. You think you can beat me? You will never, <coughs> never beat me. You get all these tantalising glimpses of what it was like to grow up in the household of Sherlock and Mycroft Holmes, his brother, uh, but it doesn't really amount to that much. and. Really, if you were a theatre goer in the 80s, like I was, it was just a question of sitting back and basking in the performances of uh, Brett and Hardwick, which so many of us had loved on TV, and, and that's what we were there for, just to lap this stuff up. It may surprise you to know that it was only necessary for me to appear in public this body art in twice. The play was a fixture in London for a year, from September 88 to 89, and then went on a tour of the UK, which is how I came to see it again, probably in a much better seat, in a cheaper seat in the provinces, um, at, at Birmingham Alexandra Theatre. 
and I uh, see there's Jeremy Beck's autograph <laughs> uh, obtained at the stage doors. I, I, I pretty much, I probably went to see a matinee, in fact I'm pretty sure I did. And uh, there's Edward Hardwick, He's written my name on there you see. And so, and then there's this picture that I took. Um, I, I actually had a photograph taken, or I posed for a photograph with Brett putting his arm around my shoulder, but uh, my camera failed me, which is a regret of mine. I'm lost without my boss, Will. But let's be honest here, the pressures of doing all these stage performances were not doing Brett's health any good. Um, he'd been put on lithium tablets because of his bipolar disorder. These caused him to retain fluid, he was putting on weight, he was short of breath sometimes. And in 1995, he died aged 59. And so with hindsight, whatever my reservations may have been about the play, I, I couldn't be happier that I saw it twice. Thanks for listening to me waffling on. I'll put some links in the description that might interest you. If you would care to like and or subscribe, that would be very nice. And what would be great is if, if you saw the play um, on its original run and you felt like sharing your reminiscences, uh, I would love to hear that. Thanks again for watching. Bye-bye.